Hello. Hello. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, welcome to the uh, Linguistics Beyond Academia Special Interest Group's first ever event and the first regional event for the Washington DC area. We're happy you're here. Um, we have a lot to get through today and we have a lot of people joining us also uh, via GoToMeeting. So if you can hear me, hello. Um, Anna Marie Chester. And Anastasia Newland, we are the co-conveners of this group, and tonight we are going to essentially show you a little bit about what it is that we do um, to promote, you know, professional development and career education for linguists um, who wish to pursue careers in a wide variety of fields. Today we're focusing on research careers. Uh, we're going to start with just a couple of quick opening remarks by the executive director of the LSA, um, Alison Reed, for a couple of minutes, and then we will move on to our very full program. Thanks, Sam. Uh, welcome, everyone. I wanted to start by thanking uh, the Center for Applied Linguistics for hosting us here, and uh, Donna Christian, who is a member of the Special Interest Group and is the emeritus uh, president of the center, uh, is the one who let you in downstairs, and I'm sure she'll be coming up to join us shortly. And uh, the center um, has a long, uh, and wonderful uh, partnership with the Linguistic Society of America, um, which is uh, the organization I'm representing here tonight. And uh, Anastasia made reference to the special interest group uh, for linguistics beyond academia. And that's a special interest group of the Linguistic Society of America. So we have um, special interest groups that members of the LSA can form around uh, areas of interest, whether it might be um, African American English, we have a special interest group focused on um, linguists who study um, those kinds of uh, phenomenon. Um, we have this uh, newly formed special interest group on um, uh, linguistics beyond academia, um, and uh, we have a mechanism in place for um, like-minded linguists to come together and start uh, additional special interest groups at any time, and that information is all on our website. Um, we have a whole range of committees as well that focus on issues like endangered languages and um, language in the school curriculum um, and uh, the status of women in linguistics and some other um, areas. So I encourage you all to, to find out more about those. I brought some literature about the Linguistic Society of America. It's on the back table there. Um, there's a student membership. Uh, there's a regular membership for um, people who have completed their um, training in linguistics and membership is actually open to anyone um, who has uh, a shared interest in our mission, which is to advance the scientific study of language. So if you're not familiar with the LSA or uh, you're not already a member, I encourage you to uh, become a member, um, become more active in the special interest group that um, is co convened <coughs> by uh, Anna Marie Trester and Anastasia Neelan. And uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, let the panelists come and uh, make their remarks. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Allison. Before we move on to the panel, just a couple of remarks, I suppose, about the special interest group. Uh, just like Allison mentioned, we are part of the LSA, so the special interest group is open to any active LSA member. Uh, what we do is, uh, starting just a few months ago. We only started this whole thing in May, I believe, right? Something to that effect. Um, because both Anna and I have a fair bit of amount of experience um, working with linguists who are coming to the end of their training and they're thinking, oh gosh, what's next? You know, if I'm not going to the professoriate or if I never um, thought about going into the professoriate in the first place, um, what happens? How can I meet other people who have done interesting things, et cetera, and how can I um, prepare myself in the best way possible for that? So we actually speak to three um, areas of interests for linguists. We uh, speak to the interest of professionals, linguistic, linguistically trained professionals who are not working as faculty. Uh, that's actually quite a few of us here today. Um, we're speaking to the needs of graduate students and undergraduate students in linguistics at any level um, who want to find out more, right? And we're also speaking to the needs of linguistics faculty, who I know like want to be better about to be better informed about how to sort of shepherd their students towards the careers that they want, whether they be whether they be faculty careers or non-faculty careers. Um, and we do this through a series of different kinds of events. We um, just a couple of things that we've done in the past few short months is um, 
we organized a networking event, a pretty large scale one of about 100 people at the annual meeting in Portland, Oregon of the Linguistic Society of America. Hugely popular, all the graduate students just like flooded. Mm -hmm. They wanted to talk to everybody who worked at the companies they wanted to work at. Um, this past July, Anna and I held a all day workshop um, about career exploration for linguists at the um, Linguistic Summer Institute, I believe is the official name of it, in, at the University of Chicago. Um, and Anna has also held several salons, just kind of informal gathering spaces for professional linguists to, to share information and resources and you know, shared questions around some of these issues. Um, these are the things that we do for and with our members. So we would love for you to join us um, after seeing all that we can do today. Um, it's all in the, in the service of the mission of promoting um, ideas about career diversity for linguistics professionals. So um, a little bit about ourselves, I guess we should introduce ourselves sure. as well. Um, I am on the faculty in linguistics at Georgetown University, but I'm not a regular faculty member. Um, I also run a professionally oriented master's program that we have there called the MA in Language and Communication. And so a lot of what I do, aside from teaching linguistics, is this kind of stuff. I do outreach work. Um, I talk to students, and I advise students, and I talk to professionals, and I get advice from professionals um, about careers for linguists. So this is very much something that's in my wheelhouse. And I'm Anna Marie Dresser. I work at the Frameworks Institute. You'll hear in a minute from uh, one of my colleagues here tonight. So I won't say a whole lot about uh, who we are and what we do as an institute, but uh, I will say, you know, you're you're hearing a lot tonight about uh, careers in research. That's because that's the theme of tonight. Um, I work on the learning team at the institute, so. Uh, there may be a future panel in the in the making of uh, careers in uh, educating education in, in you know non-academic contexts. Uh, for any of you who have interest in education, there are there are people in the room who have interesting uh, thoughts on the subject as well. Uh, in addition to myself, uh, we're going to be I'll put in a little plug for what's going to happen at the end of this. So be thinking. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a little simulation of a networking. We're going to be doing a networking we're event, doing a yeah. live experience of networking. Um, so as you're listening to people, you know, um, be thinking about questions that you want to ask them in front of the group, but then also be thinking about how you would transition uh, into one-on-one -on -one conversations. We we found that um, you know one of the reasons to have events like this is that. You know, sometimes it just you you need to have some practice mm -hmm. in networking, and, and the people who are here will tell you, I'm sure, in their remarks that networking is probably the way that you're going to get a job. So uh, this is why we organize events like this. We actually would uh, want you to also look at an event like this as a model for a thing that any of you might organize. Those of you who are in other cities listening to us on the webinar. Um, we want this to be something that can be, you know, a touch point for someone in their city, in their community, to talk to people who have jobs locally, mm -hmm. but uh, to learn more broadly and okay. share share information more broadly. At any scale, anything from a workshop to a panel to an informal discussion to a networking event, anything is anything is possible, and that's kind of what we're demoing here today. Um, so we're going to start with our panel. Uh, We'll hear from three professional linguists. There will be ample time for questions, so please do think of questions. Following this, um, Anna will give you a little bit more information about how to network effectively, just as a freebie. Um, and then we will spend the last <laughs> half hour from 7 to 7.30 with refreshments and uh, conversation. That is what we're going to do. So um, thank you all so much for coming. And let me um, just call up and introduce our three panelists for the evening. So first, we have Michael Myers. Um, who is a research sociolinguist in the Language and Cross-Cultural Research Group at the U.S. Census Bureau. So we have government represented, government research. Marissa Fond is a researcher um, at the Frameworks Institute, nonprofit think tank. Is a decent description? Yes. Excellent. Great. And then Jennifer <laughs> Wren, many of you know Jennifer Wren. She's a senior research associate and also the chair of the IRB here at Center for Applied Linguistics. So uh, <laughs> let's welcome our uh, panelists. Okay. 
I will moderate this panel, so I'll, I'll get us get us started. But I do expect that you'll probably have lots of things to say without my prompting. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today um, and allowing us to show the diversity that exists of different kinds of research career paths for linguists with different kinds of training. So uh, I'd like to just give each of you an opportunity to like accurately um, and in the way that you like uh, introduce yourselves and describe a little bit about you know your path, your training, how you got to where you are, um, and what you're doing now, and maybe how you feel about it. That's a lot of things, but just in a narrative fashion. So, Michael, let's start with you. Um, so I am a research sociolinguist at the U.S. Census Bureau, and I completed my undergraduate and graduate degrees at Georgetown University. So I was a double major as an undergraduate in linguistics and Spanish. And I liked Georgetown so much that I stuck around and got the master's degree in sociolinguistics. Um, so when I tell people that I'm a sociolinguist and I work at the Census Bureau, the first question that everybody asks me is, what is a sociolinguist? Um, <laughs> so I'm sure all of you can relate to some form of that question if you're in the room. Uh, but then the second question would be, what, what is a sociolinguist doing at the U.S. Census Bureau? Um, and I actually wanted to touch on a point um, that was made earlier about how important networking is. Um, so I got an internship at the Census Bureau when I was a grad student because of attending an event like this that was hosted by Anna Marie Truster at that time. So I, I do think you did something really important. Um, they've been helpful for my career. So just to say briefly what it is that I do, um, I do testing of translated survey materials um, with people, and in our studies we call them respondents, to make sure that they're linguistically and culturally appropriate. And we do that um, with a couple different methods. We do focus groups. So we get a group of people together and we talk to them and tape record it and transcribe and summarize it. We do cognitive interviews, um, which draws some on some cognitive psychological principles of interviewing, um, but which I use a lot of discourse analysis for. Um, we also record those interviews, transcribe parts of them and summarize them. And then we also do usability testing. So there's a technological component to that research where we're tracking respondents' eye movements so that we can get a sense of what text they actually read what text they don't notice at all, which tends to be instructions, um, <laughs> as well as text that they go back and reread again and again, which can indicate that they might be having a problem with the question. Um, so we collect this data, and we try to make the translations as good as possible. Um, I feel like I'm talking for a long time. Can I? Okay. It's your floor. It's my floor. All right. Um, but I just want to say a quick word about why I think the work we do is really important and why I stuck around at the Census Bureau. So the Census Bureau is the largest data collection agency in the U.S. for government agencies. We collect a lot of information from the U.S. population for lawmakers um, in Congress and the White House and for other researchers to use. And I think the U.S. is a really over-surveyed population, so we tend to be very blasé about this and feel like it's burdensome. Like there's a pollster who's going to call me at dinner time and interrupt me. Or I go to Taco Bell and the back of my receipt says that I need to fill out a survey. Um, but the data that we collect is used to make sure that we're fairly allocating resources um, and that we're setting up policies and programs that are needed. And when you speak English, you have the opportunity to participate in these data collection endeavors. But if you speak a language other than English, you're often excluded. Um, so your voice is not heard and your experiences are not tabulated. Um, so the work that we do is really to make sure that people have access to these types of surveys. And as a result, the data is a higher quality and lawmakers have access to that data. So I think it's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thank you all for being here. It's really just such a pleasure to see you all here and so many familiar faces, too. Um, I am Marissa Fond, and I'm a researcher at the Frameworks Institute, um, which is a uh, nonprofit uh, social science based think tank that does work on uh, communicating more effectively about domestic and, uh, and increasingly international uh, social issues with the ultimate goal of creating social change um, through better communication. Um, and so just to walk you through really briefly um, uh, some of the work that we do, kind of a, a life cycle of a typical project, um, I and um, my uh, fellow researchers who are all social scientists, so um, certainly anthropologists and sociologists, psychologists and others, um, as well as linguists, um, we'll do, um, we do the same kind of process for every um, project that we do. And so what we will try to do first is to 
um, through interviews with um, experts in a, in a given field um, on a given issue, um, we'll try to distill an expert story of that issue. So beyond, um, beyond the literature review that we would do on this topic, we want to understand how professionals talk about their work and what they prioritize, what they think is important, the messages that, that they work with every day in their fields, the messages that aren't shared by the public at large. Um, we distill that story um, into something very simple and um, shared among the members of the field. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll do much uh, longer semi-structured interviews with members of the public who are not experts on this topic. And what we're trying to do there is get a sense of um, what uh, ways of thinking, patterns of thinking, we call them at frameworks um, cultural models from the anthropological literature, but you could also think of them as um, schemas um, and, and similar, um, similar terms. We're trying to see what patterns of thinking the public bring to these same issues. Um, and we want to know, after our uh, analysis uh, of those data, where the really important gaps are between the way that experts understand uh, their field and the way that the public think about these topics. Um, because in the, in the work that we do on uh, domestic social issues, certainly um, the public bring a lot of thoughts to, to topics like education or immigration or climate change or all of these things. And so um, what we do when we try to uh, get a sense of where those big uh, gaps are um, is that we try to then develop uh, framing strategies that will allow the experts um, in their field and, and advocates who are interested in promoting um, uh, this expert knowledge um, ways to talk about these topics in, um, in effective ways that the public will um, will be able to work with and understand in a new way that would hopefully lead to changes in thinking about these issues um, through communication. Um, and so one of the things that I do um, increasingly at Frameworks is lead work on developing metaphors and different names and labels for, um, for certain ideas. So um, recently we've been thinking about naming and you know um, what does what does that allow us to do? It allows us to set a problem in a specific way. You all have experience with this, certainly. Um, you know, uh, being consumers of news and being politically active, certainly. Um, it allows us to set the problem, create a linguistic object that is then able to be shared um, in a way that it wasn't before, and that allows us to. Um, in the long term, kind of see some change in the way that we communicate about these, um, you know, very difficult and sometimes very personal and emotional um, problems that we face together um, as a as a as a society. Um, and so, I'm really um, happy to um, talk more and answer your questions about you know the specifics of, of what we do at Frameworks. Um, but certainly, as a linguist, there. Um, there's really um, a lot of work to do in collaboration with my um, social scientist colleagues, certainly. So that's something that um, I'm keen to speak about, too, because um, often I call myself a sociolinguist and often I call myself a social scientist. And sometimes those differences um, become more important than other times. Um, and so I'm very interested to hear from you and, and the questions that you have. But I'll hand it over to Jen. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my place of work. That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Jen. I um, have been here at Cal for two and a half years now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my path because it's really a little convoluted and so maybe some of you can relate. Um, I um, actually went to college planning to be an engineer. Had an epiphany in um, chemistry class one day that I was not going to take a class called heat, heat transfer and then switched majors, and ended up majoring in government and econ. But that kind of happened because I really liked learning languages. I studied German in high school, French in college, so I was interested in international relations. Um, 
you know, and thought about law school, was a paralegal for a bit, didn't go to law school, thank goodness, and kind of in all that, I'd taken some linguistics courses in college, and they were the classes that I always just raved about. I think four or five of my friends took Ling 101 because I encouraged them to. Um, they should have paid me. Um, but uh, yeah, so kind of going back and thinking about what I really loved, it was always talking and thinking about language. Um, so then I worked for a couple of years as a research assistant in a developmental psychology lab because I was also really interested in um, language acquisition right, and how, how children develop language. And that was a nice way um, to kind of get into linguistics uh, through psychology, right, and to see how it really does interact with so many other fields. Um, I went to graduate school um, at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, where uh, I was interested in studying acquisition and sociolinguistics. Um, UNC is really a theoretical <coughs> linguistics program. So the nice thing for me was I got a nice theoretical background, but I knew going there, if I wanted to be a sociolinguist, I had to connect with Walt Wolfram, who was at NC State. So that was like the one networking thing I did in my early 20s um, that I was really proud of, was I took his class. They had an RA position open to work on a project studying um, African American English, and then that became my master's thesis and my dissertation. So um, I, and actually it became my postdoc too, so I graduated um, and did a postdoc at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute, um, where I continued doing um, work on the project, uh, this longitudinal study of African American um, kids, and started looking at ways that language linked to uh, literacy outcomes. I was funded by the Institute of Education Sciences through their early, um, um, early education program, so I was able, again, to see how linguistics really linked to other fields. So I've had a lot of opportunities to see the interdisciplinarity of the work that we do. Um, after my time at FPG, I came here to Cal, and um, here at Cal, I wear a number of hats. Um, as Anastasia mentioned, I and not only a senior research associate, but I am the IRB chair, which is a position I never, ever expected to hold. <laughs> um, I, like many of you, um, you know, when I was in, in graduate school and my postdoc, you know, dreaded submitting IRB applications and just found it to be this horrible red tape, and now I'm like the advocate for human, human subjects <laughs> at Cal, um, which has actually been a really wonderful experience to be on that other side um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I get to see the, the wide array of project work that goes on here at Cal. Um, as the chair, all of the applications come through me at some point, so it's a really nice way to have a, like, keep in touch with the work that we do here. Um, because most of my work actually lies within the language testing area. Um, here at Cal, we have lots of applied linguists, a lot of language testers, psychometricians, a lot of educators, so people of different backgrounds. Um, and there are a few sociolinguists here. Um, we're, we're small but mighty um, and trying to get my ear. But so um, I feel fortunate that I get to bring that sociolinguistic perspective to the language testing arm of Cal. And so I'm not sure if we'll be talking like in detail about stuff that we're doing, but um, I have brought um, a lot of my uh, experience with transcription and coding, right, which I did a lot in my graduate work. I think I transcribed you know, 80 hours a week for a whole summer, probably many can relate, um, and develop, you know, learned how to look at language in a systematic way. Um, and look for patterns of language, and now I'm able to do that looking at student responses and then making sure that we are writing test questions that actually get the kinds of responses that we're looking for and give students the opportunity to show us the kind of language we want to elicit. Um, my colleague Sam Musser and I are doing a, a project looking at a constructed dialogue in speaking responses and thinking of that as a way to maybe look at students that are at higher proficiency levels because it's really hard to get the really proficient students of English to show that um, ability. Um, and so there are lots of ways where I feel like the work that I do intersects with yeah, the testing, with professional development work that is done here. Um, and um, to kind of end the way uh, that Michael ended it, the thing that I think is really important and special about what we do here at Cal is that we get to really directly interact and connect with people in a tangible way. Um, obviously, testing is a real uh, hot topic. People have very strong opinions about testing, and I certainly understand that. I'm the daughter of a teacher <laughs> and the sister of a teacher and the piece of five teachers, so lots of teachers. 
So I, I understand that. Um, but I think about when I went back to North Carolina to visit friends, I was talking to some of the statisticians I used to work with. And of course, these are numbers people, so they get it. But saying, you know, it, it, sometimes it's hard to talk about testing because people have such like a visceral reaction to it. So negative. And he said, yeah, but we, we have to measure it somehow, right? So I feel like what we do in the testing part here at Cal, because that's what I mostly do, is we make sure that we measure it well, right? If we have to measure it, Right? We want to make sure that we're measuring it the best way we can. And if we're going to be looking at things like English language proficiency, you need linguists here to be informing that development. And um, so I think that this is a place where having that linguistics background, the expertise, and the knowledge of the intricacies of language is so, so vital. Great. Thank you all uh, so much for those introductions. Um, I want to focus the questions that I have, which I'm kind of intuiting what some of you at least um, kind of want to know. I would like to focus on two things. Number one, the differences between academic research and industry research. Um, oftentimes I hear from students that they're really anxious about not being able to adequately um, explain what it is that they do in a way that's going to be um, attractive to employers because they just have no idea about what kinds of standards and expectations come with um, you know, that are like behind the job description researcher at any um, given kind of organization. So I don't know if you guys could maybe speak a little bit to what you have found to be like the, the kind of common touching points and also some of the differences between academic research as a thing and, and industry research, the kind of work that you do. I, I, <laughs> Sorry, You're sorry. out of order, Marissa. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. This is a conversation. Um, yeah, so um, let me see if I can hit both parts of that. Um, I would say, you know, the difference between academic research and, uh, and industry research. Um, one is that, you know, as I was describing um, the process that frameworks typically goes through on a, on a given project, um, you know, that means that that process has to be gone through on a, on a typical project. And so that means that the research that I do has to um, fit within that model. Um, that's not to say that I don't have some space um, in my role as a researcher um, to develop new ways of investigating the questions that we have or addressing them um, in different ways. But certainly it's important, um, you know, just to recognize that difference, that, um, that, that there is a way that an organization um, decides that the research will be conducted on a certain timeline and in a certain way and to, um, to certain uh, standards. And so um, the freedom, um, which, which can be wonderful and, and crushing of, um, you know, working on your own project like a thesis or a dissertation is just so different when you're working in, in industry. Um, and I think that um, the second part of that, um, the, way that, the way that I understood that, that question about, you know, how do you, um, as a researcher, position yourself to, to an organization um, if, you're, if you might be uh, applying for a position, um, really the first thing that I thought of is, is how important it is to familiarize with yourself with that organization's work and that will give you the clues that you need to position yourself in a way that um, will be attractive to that organization because yes certainly um, the, the unique skills and experiences that you bring are important but an organization wants to know that when it comes time to uh, launch a project and you need to start work and jump onto it, that you can handle that. And so certainly I know that the Census Bureau um, and Frameworks as well, um, and Cal, uh, <laughs> everyone, mm -hmm. um, makes their, their research available um, to you, uh, to everybody. And so that's certainly the place to, to start. Can I just jump off of that? And that that's a great point to make about becoming familiar with the research. And you know, the Census Bureau has to publish their reports and share their data. And 
when you are interviewing somebody and they've taken the time to look at that, mm -hmm. you see a level of interest that's very exciting. You're thinking, this is somebody who's going to want to work on these projects and who's going to want to contribute. Um, and, and a big difference for me between you know research that I was doing in grad school and research that I do at the Census Bureau is obviously the fact that what I'm doing now is much more applied. So I'm not necessarily just looking at something because I'm curious. You know, we have survey sponsors and they keep the lights on and, and we do this research for them, right? We're looking at these translations. And the way that the group that I'm working in is structured, so I'm in the language and cross-cultural research group um, of the Center for Survey Measurement. We have 80% of our time devoted to working on sponsored projects and 20% of our time that's devoted to independent research. And what many of us do is find ways to build in our independent research to these sponsored projects so that we can be collecting data and analyzing it as we go along, um, which is a little bit more efficient. So I mostly do interviewing in English and in Spanish, but I lead projects where we're doing testing in seven different languages. So we normally do English, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Russian, and Arabic. And I've gotten really good at listing those seven off. <laughs> um, so I try to embed research into the different projects that we're doing. So, you know, one thing that we have ongoing right now is um, we're collecting data in cognitive interviews and focus groups, and we're using vignettes, which is survey speak for hypothetical situations where you ask respondents a survey question about a situation they don't really live in, and we're doing it in seven languages. So we can see how do the responses that I get from this for Korean speakers differ when I'm in a one-on-one -on -one interaction with them versus when there's a group interaction and you're having this conversation mediated by several different people. Um, and then we can also look at cross languages. So if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one interview, how do these responses differ across these seven languages and, and why do I think this might be happening for these hypothetical situations? Um, and that's not sponsored, but we just sort of threw it in there because we're already doing these interviews and we thought it would be interesting to look at you know, what these cross-cultural differences are. So that's the type of thing that we do to sort of do research that interests us, but also do research that's more applied for the community that we're working in. Yeah, I think you both covered it pretty well. But one thing that I have found that, um, you know, as I said, I'm not a language tester and I work in the language testing division, so that sometimes is a little struggle because it's not like that's my love. But I can bring skills and interests that I have, as you've mentioned, to, um, to the projects that I work on in language testing. So, for example, um, one of the big things that we've been doing here for the last couple of years in the, in the um, English language testing area is transitioning from paper to computer-based testing. And, you know, that brings a lot of questions for me in terms of making sure you're measuring the same things um, uh, in lots of ways. And so we're working on a study of keyboarding, right, seeing if students are able to show the same quality of um, response in keyboarded responses versus handwritten responses. And, um, you know, on the surface, that's not really my, my background, so it was African American English, language development, I mean, language development, I guess, is in there. I actually, style shifting was the focus of my dissertation. Um, but I did a lot of uh, development of coding protocols, right? So I got this and was told, okay, we have to do some kind of linguistic analysis. Mm -hmm. I was like, great, um, mm -hmm. that sounds awesome. And I thought, okay, well, why not? Why don't I think about how I would code this? So I was able to take the skills that I had, you know, that I had developed in graduate school studying spoken language and think about how can I analyze these these tests, you know, these student responses in a way. Um, where I'm using the skills that I have developed as a linguist. And so that was actually really um, uh, gratifying to see that transfer of skills from a, to a very different project. And then that also made it a lot more interesting to me because I was able to develop this coding protocol. So it was, like you said, sort of within the boundaries of our funders, right? And we don't have, right, like you said, it is like a crushing flexibility when you can do anything in a sense. It's exciting and terrifying. So you have these constraints which can be frustrating, but then at the same time, you can use that as a way to take your skills, that, the skills you have, and expand them and apply them in a different way. So I found that to be something um, that I've been able to do here. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and also, again, the work that Sam and I are doing is sort of taking this discourse analytic framework and applying it to the speaking test, right? You wouldn't necessarily think we would look at it from a linguistic perspective, but this is work that really needs to be done with these kinds of tests. So, um, so yeah, so it, sometimes it can be a little bit, I guess, tricky to navigate that, but it, I think partly it also takes practice. It's like once you are there for a bit, you see where you can bring your background and your expertise into the work that you're doing. Um, I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions from the audience, but one last thing so that, so that I can elicit 
a particular type of discourse from you because that is my expertise, um, is all of you mentioned that it's important um, to abstract away from your research topic, whether you did it at the undergraduate level, at the master's level, at the PhD level, and think more concretely about what was it that you did in graduate school that might actually you know, be transferable, be useful. Not, let me, let me say, let me take that back. It's all useful. Um, but things that uh, people who haven't gone through that crushing freedom um, of, of doing self-directed research are going to understand and are going to appreciate. So I would like to uh, ask you guys to tell me, tell us, what are some sort of concrete skills that you have been able to, you know, harness and use in your everyday life, in your everyday um, work life that, you know, that are not style shifting. Style shifting right. is not, a, it, is a, it is an interactional skill, but it's not something that you can present as being part of your professional expertise outside of the academic setting, perhaps. Okay. That's kind of an interesting exercise that, that I try to do fairly often, and it can be, it's trickier than you think, so, but that is why you are where you are, is because you were able to successfully do it. Well, I don't know if this is mm -hmm. exactly what you're getting at, but I think one thing that I've been doing a lot lately, partly because I've shifted into a new role, which is very research-oriented mm -hmm. here at Cal, so I'm doing lots of little research projects, um, and also I've been part of a couple of recent grant proposals, is getting better at thinking about research design and how to collect and deal with data, mm -hmm. right, in a way that, you know, in, in all kinds of data, like student writing responses, you know, teacher, you know, teacher training and dual language programs, like lots of different things. And so I, I feel like a skill from having worked on a project, right, because I did work on a research project with a research team in graduate mm -hmm. school, so I got to see um, you know, experienced uh, principal investigators who knew how to ask a research question, who knew how to think about the kinds of data that you would need to answer that question and all of that. So that's something, that's a skill that I think just having, even if it's not for a research project, is still useful in terms of thinking through um, any kind of issue, right, small or large. Um, you know, what's your question? What information do you need to answer that question? And how are you answer that question? Um, so that's something that I feel like has been very transferable to lots of stuff that I do here. Systemic thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And knowing how to maybe anticipate roadblocks down the road. Right. And, and yeah, and just having a clear thought process mm -hmm. um, in terms of, in fact, here I've been making lots of, um, because it's helpful to me to have, um, have a process. So I've actually created documents here where we sit down and we say, what are our research questions? What are the tasks you have to do? Like literally list it all out to make sure that you're thinking things through in a systematic way. Yeah. We like hiring linguists at the Census Bureau in my area. We've been hiring people from Georgetown for a while, um, which was really lucky for me. Um, and, and I think there are many ways where what we study, particularly in sociolinguistics, but in, in other disciplines as well, has a strong overlap with, with the research that we're doing. So survey interactions are a very bounded kind of discourse, and they're quirky and interesting to me, um, because interviewers have a, a very particular script that they have to follow, and there's no mediation of meaning between respondents and interviewers. So respondents don't understand something, and interviewers don't have a way to correct this, right, because of the scripts. So they can be very broken interactions, which makes them fun to study. Um, and try to improve, hopefully. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of this notion of, of conversation analysis. We're doing a lot of interviewing respondents, of recording these interviews, and of you know, transcribing and summarizing them. And so linguists tend to be really good at that, actually. So it's a great area to recruit from for us. Um, also this understanding of, of sort of the way you would structure discourse and messaging. So we do so much research with PR firms about how we're going to tell people about the census and that it's confidential and your response is required by law. You can't take that and translate that line by line into Chinese. It's not going to work, right? Because the way the message uh, should be set up is different. Um, and linguists are really good about anticipating problems like that. Um, also, the qualitative field methods background that I had, the type of ethnographic observation that you practice doing and watching people's behavior in elevators, that was a fun thing that we did. Um, and things like that is really useful because we do field observations and we actually follow interviewers in the field. We don't participate and we just observe what's happening. Um, to try to figure out how do we get people to let us in the door? How do we get people to, to respond and cooperate? And I think these are all skills that linguists often bring to the table, and they're also used to coding data and analyzing it in many cases because of a background maybe in, in variation. 
Um, <coughs> so that's been helpful too. I will just um, add to those responses very, very briefly by, by saying that um, one of the interesting things about being at Frameworks is I mentioned all the different disciplines of social science um, that make up our research team. And it's um, really interesting to see how those disciplines interact with each other and how they balance each other. It's really um, something that's, that, that's great about Frameworks and certainly about um, a place like uh, the Census Bureau as We well. do have our psychologists and our anthropologists and our sociologists. And and I think that um, just as a quick example um, of uh, something that I, I've brought up um, at Frameworks as a, as a social linguist is that um, we, we do a lot of different types of interviewing um, in our um, descriptive and, and prescriptive research. And I think thinking of an interview as an interaction is something that I think for sociolinguists is something that is we just we just know to be to be true. Um, but that's not something that we can always take for granted. And and that that other people would share that that view. But when you think about designing an interview guide or about uh, analyzing data that result from interviews and and how they um, how a conversation emerges um, as a series of, you know, um, as a sequenced series. I mean, it, it can be, um, I found it to be really um, helpful to bring that training to bear on how we understand the work that we do and what meaning we, um, we take from that work. So I think that, um, yeah, that balance of a lot of different disciplines is, um, is a very positive thing. So we're hearing lots of actually good concrete tips here, right? Is focus on things like coding, things like making the data make sense when it doesn't initially in a way that linguists are able to do because we're used to looking at the world in a certain way. And before we move on to audience questions, I want to just very briefly editorialize a little bit and say that um, we have a, a really strong representation of uh, sociolinguists in the room today, but this stuff is something that is absolutely, uh, you know, applies sometimes even more so to linguists who are coming from other subdisciplines of linguistics. Because truly, what makes linguists, what sets linguists apart is that we work with natural data that is inherently incredibly chaotic. And our job as linguists is to bring order to that chaos. And that is good for, you know, your academic sort of gratification <laughs> of uh, solving a puzzle. Um, it is good for the communities that you try to serve by understanding how things work. And it's going to be good for your company's bottom line as well. So that's something I think that you, know, you can think about and, and feel good about yourself. Because as a linguist, you do have this very, very, very um, unique skill set that not many, not many other disciplines can, can claim, I think. Um, but I do want to open up the floor for uh, questions from the audience for the panelists about what a good 10 minutes. Anyone's got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, my name is Allison Karras. Uh, I just have a question, and thank you again for speaking with us, about your day-to-day -day lifestyles and how, how are they on a, on a daily basis? What do you do? Uh, could you give us an example of just whatever day you want to share with us, but just some real concrete, um, you know, not hour to hour, but <laughs> daily mm -hmm. lifestyle, if you wouldn't mind? Um, so from a day this week, we have a project that we're trying to do right now in Puerto Rico to figure out why we don't have addresses that work for people who live in Puerto Rico, because we don't. Um, and so we're going to be doing some focus groups there to talk to people about how their addresses are set up. So we were meeting with some stakeholders about planning that. Um, and then I've been getting the summaries on seven languages for a lot of the interviews that we're doing. So I've been reading a lot of interview summaries right now um, and trying to think about ways that we can present findings to our sponsors. Um, and then we're actually getting ready for a new round of testing that's going to be kicking off in English and Spanish soon. So also meetings for that. So this has been kind of a meeting heavy week for me, but I have weeks where I'm doing a lot of interviewing. So I'm not in a data collection point right now. I'm in an analysis point right now. Um, yeah, I would say um, 
pet frameworks, for example, um, we might be working on, say, you know, uh, four to ten projects simultaneously, and all of those would be in very different stages. And so um, the stages that I described earlier might all be occurring on the same day. So I might have um, a phone interview scheduled with um, one of the um, experts that we're interviewing for, for an early phase of research. Um, I might be writing um, an internal analysis document. So a lot of the writing that we do um, is, um, is um, data analysis that we use internally to then um, make decisions and fuel future research and um, feed into um, public reports that we write. So I also might be working on um, something like that, like the, the final report on the project that's, that's finishing up. Um, I also might be um, developing um, final drafts of messages that we're going to test uh, on the street. So um, I'll be traveling um, next week and the week after for two different projects um, to test different messages on different topics, so housing and criminal justice. Um, and so I will have my head in in those topics as well, and so um, I think I think it's it's a nice um, thing to have um, a lot of chaos, but it keeps uh, the day interesting. Yeah, and actually, my my life is very similar to yours. Where I'm working on many different things. Um, I tend to work better in chunks, though, so I'll spend like half a day on just one thing. But the kinds of things, well, today, actually, I spent the entire day editing a really long document, so that's not that fun. But um, <laughs> other days, um, you know, I might be meeting with colleagues to, well, well last week, um, a couple of my colleagues and I went through this coding protocol we developed to look at um, errors in keyboarding and finding places where we did. Um, so I had done the uh, iterator reliability, found some codes that we didn't do so well on, and went back to look at those decide how we could describe these codes in a better way so that we're more, more consistent about coding them. So things like that, tweaking, um, those kinds of things. Um, I um, might also be yeah, meeting with colleagues for a new project to fill out the form that I'm so proud of, where we, you know, uh, <laughs> just kind of get, figuring out the scope of the project, um, discussing, um, you know, how it's going to look, figuring out timelines for that project. Um, and, um, you know, or looking, perhaps looking at some data, really getting into it, either transcribing it, uh, in the case of the speaking data, kind of <coughs> listening to it um, to get a sense of how we might develop some codes. And then as um, IRB chair, I, I answer lots of questions and figure things out. Um, I, you know, a lot of, the, the good thing is um, because we're so small, you know, I have a lot of interaction with different PIs on projects, so people have different questions about me as far as, or questions for me about how um, uh, how they should um, fill out forms or how they should interact with partners, Cal partners with probably frameworks and um, probably census does too. We have a lot of projects that um, are, have multiple partners working on them and so there are a lot of um, IRB related issues with that and so um, you know, kind of figuring out how to deal with agreements and data sharing and all of that. So. Um, yeah, it, it's, it kind of just depends on the day, but there's a lot of different things I work on. Mm -hmm. Great question. Other questions from the audience? Um, this might be best for Jen, but I don't know if you guys, I wouldn't speak to your experience, but I'm actually currently working and going to school, and I think one of the struggles I have is um, like expressing that identity as a sociolinguist in a place full of engineers, um, where like it's just not quite as relevant. I'm not doing research, so I can't kind of like put on that academic researcher hat and say, well, at least it's connected that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you mentioned you're not a language tester, but and you have to kind of work within that space and say, like, how do I express my identity, but also like get the work done that I'm doing? And I've, I've got a couple of my own strategies, but I would just love to hear from people about, like, where you find that space to express that part of you and yet also contribute to the projects that are going on that are, you know, you're getting paid for. But, um, yeah, so I don't know if that 
questions make sense to you. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, well, yeah, I mean, it can be really tricky to, to balance your interests and what you'd like to do with what um, your company's being paid to do, particularly if you don't work with people that share your interests, yeah. right? <laughs> um, uh, and I can imagine with engineers, yeah, you get that. So how many languages do you speak question all the time? Um, but I think um, part of it is you, I mean, you have to sort of respect the boundaries of the project that you have to work on, right? Because they're paying you to do whatever they're paying you to do. Yeah. So that is priority. But then, yeah, I guess where you can see places where your background and your expertise can actually um, enhance and improve the project, speak up, you know what I mean? Just yeah. see, look for places where, where, and I'm sure there are many of them, um, yeah, as a, as a. So now I was great that. communicators. So that's, that's another, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is another part. Um, I think the other thing too is the longer that you're at a place and people respect you just as a colleague, yeah. the more that they respect all of the things that you bring to a project and to a team. Um, I know that, uh, you know, just in the last few months, I've really been pushing. So Cal, um, actually Donna and Carolyn have a long history here of doing great work on, on variation and um, really a lot of sociolinguistic issues that hasn't been at the forefront of Cal's research agenda lately that I would like to resurrect. And so after being here for two years, I've been able to finally kind of be more vocal about that and try to think of ways to rebuild that and tie it into like the testing stuff. Yeah. Whereas I feel like if I'd done that six months and people would be like, who are you? What's your name? Yeah. <laughs> That's not what we do here. You know what I mean? So I think part of it is just as you, you know, as a colleague, as you gain confidence um, and your colleagues gain confidence in you, you can think of ways to incorporate that. I think she has something I wanted to add to that. So um, I've talked a lot about the role of linguists with the Census Bureau, but I work in a small division of the Center for Survey Measurement, which is where I think all the linguists except for one are. Um, and the vast majority of the 6,000 people who are at headquarters of the Census Bureau are statisticians. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, we are tremendously outnumbered. And the Census Bureau deals in massive amounts of data, right? So, I mean, they have data on every single person in the whole country. And so qualitative research is sort of the redheaded stepchild of the Census Bureau in that sense. Um, and, and it's often looked down on by people who aren't very familiar with the work that we do here in other divisions. Um, so they have data sets with millions of people in them. And they find out that I did 40 interviews. And I want to talk to them about what's broken in their questionnaire. And, you know, they kind of laugh about this, like, yeah, thanks so much for that, I appreciate it. Um, but we don't need to do, you know, millions of interviews to tell you what's wrong with your questionnaire. And I can save you a lot of money, actually, before you field that survey um, by doing a couple of these interviews. And so I have found that when we have these sponsors who are initially very skeptical, who are required to work with us because they have to meet a minimum standard of pre-testing to field their survey instruments, but they can be really hostile up front. They have no notion what we do or why they have to do it. And they just want me to put my initials on something that says that they've pre-tested you know, what they needed to. Um, but we try to build up these relationships with sponsors and find that usually by the end of the process, they have more buy-in to what we're doing. And, and they've seen the value that it has. Um, but a lot of that, I feel like, is me learning how to translate terminology that's very sociolinguistic into things that are meaningful for them. And speaking Absolutely. the way that they speak. Mm -hmm. Um, and also really kind of demanding a seat at the table, I think, also. So when you come to these meetings where you have people from several different divisions that are represented, mm -hmm. and there's a long, and, and I mean this literally, like there's a long table in the middle of the conference room, and there's a ring of chairs around the edge, like sit at the table, you know, because you're doing something that's valuable, even if they don't have respect for the background that you have and the research that you're doing. Excellent. We had a question in back from Karen. Uh, yes, I'm wondering about how to handle the need to develop a uh, uh, professional scholarship record. How, if you're in a, a job that, are you in a job that allows you to do publications and presentations? And if not, then how do you handle that need to fill out your resume? I can answer quickly because being in a bureaucracy, we have a form for that. Um, <laughs> no, we really do, and I actually do it September 30th. Um, <laughs> so we are required to submit to a journal every year um, to have either an acceptance or at least a submission, and every other year we need an acceptance. So we have these goals that we need to meet. You can have an off year and an on year, but in your off year, you better at least you know, submit something. Um, and then we also are required to make a certain number of presentations of our research results. 
because a central mission of the research that we're doing is that we're sharing this with you know, the US public and we're funded by taxpayer dollars. Um, and then we have to fill out research proposals every year for what research we want to work on in the upcoming year. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty central part of the work that I do. And the tension, I would say, is actually more that we're officially allocated 20% of our time to work on this, but it's a larger percentage of our performance evaluation. And when there's a lot of sponsored work, nobody's going, well, hang on a minute, because I'm working on this journal publication here, and I can't really deal with you clients. So I would say the tension is more that we are expected to do those things and then trying to find time to do them around the work that we have. Well, I would say, um, coming from academia, the nice thing for me, right, is I came here and there are people certainly that do present and publish, but most people at Cal don't, right? There are a lot of people that have masters in education and were teachers, and um, so I came in and I was like, I'll present, I'll do, you know, so I actually have gone to many conferences and presented quite a bit since I've been at Cal, um, some on work that I did, you know, in my postdoc that kind of trickled over, some on um, sociolinguistic work that I've applied to work at Cal, some that's not related to anything that I'm particularly interested in. Oh, but hey, I'll go, you know, I'll go to Portland, that's great. Um, so I've gotten to do kind of a, a quite a bit of that. In terms of publishing, I it's, it's harder, right, because um, none of my time is allocated for writing. <laughs> so really any writing I have to do is on my own time, um, and that is, is a, can be a real struggle. I mean, I have found that the most success I've had is Cal does have um, a program um, to encourage uh, publishing within Cal, and so I won, you know, I submitted a proposal and, um, you know, and, and won, you know, but the, the, the catch is you have to submit a journal article to get the money that you win. So that was a good motivator. It was like, if I submit this, I get $5,000. I've never written an article faster in my life. Um, <laughs> like every, every article should have money attached to it. Um, <laughs> Um, and then the other way that I've done it is um, I'm actually working with some uh, colleagues from UNC on a book based on the project I worked on there. And so um, my friend uh, Mary and I uh, used to, this summer we, you know, Skyped every Friday and planned book chapters. And so that was another way that, again, sort of on my own time I was able to get um, some work done in that sphere. But it is a real challenge when you have all this other work that is being funded. It has to be done. And it has to be done by September 30th. <laughs> You can't be like, sorry, I'm going to be a week late on that, you know. So, yeah, it can be challenging. Yeah, I think um, your experiences are exactly mine. Um, and uh, Framework certainly, you know, wants its research staff to remain active um, in their uh, in their fields, and there are opportunities to do that. Um, and and I've even uh, I'm. Uh, one of I'm the newest researchers still at Frameworks, and um, I've been able to do, to take advantage of that. Um, and and yet I would also say that given the constraints that, that you two mentioned and um, the way that your time is allocated, um, if what you want to do is be on the conference circuit, attending multiple conferences a year, and you want to work on submitting a number of journal, journal articles a year, um, then either you have an incredible drive to fill your free time with this, or, or you don't do this kind of work. Um, because the opportunity is there, and the space can be there, and you can make as much space as you want, but um, it's just a different rhythm of work and a different type of work, I would say. One last question, and then we will uh, regroup for some networking. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm actually an undergraduate shot. I don't know how many undergraduates in the room. It seems to be more graduates here. Um, so my question definitely coming more from an undergrad perspective, but I hope it's still relevant to people who are considering pursuing additional degrees in linguistics. Um, so my question, I'm definitely at the moment where I'm considering if I should go academia or go more applied or find a job that's in the realm but not necessarily academia. So my question is, do you think you would have been doing what you're doing now or something similarly if you had not pursued an additional degree in linguistics? That's an easy question for me to answer because I only have a master's degree and like the PhD students and I couldn't have the job I have if I only had a bachelor's degree and I'm one of like two people I think that have a master's degree in my department, so 
No, if I had not gotten a master's degree, I would not be where I am. Um, I would say that um, guests at, at Frameworks, um, it would be almost necessary to have a PhD. Um, but I would also say that um, to do this kind of work, there is certainly value in more than, than your degree. Because Frameworks wants to hire people with PhDs, but also they um, want to hire people they know, understand the world that we're working in. So having other types of experience is really important. Um, so that's probably an unsatisfying answer. Um, Frameworks is a, a little unique, I, I think, in this. I think that in a lot of um, organizations like this, um, having having a bachelor's or a master's and that uh, additional um, professional experience um, can get you very far. Um, but yes, having that other other um, experience is important. Yeah, I would actually say Cal is, I mean, depending on the position at Cal, um, your professional experience is really important too. Right? For, actually, I think even for my job, you could have a master's plus well, like 10 years of experience or something like that, which obviously I didn't have because I'm not settled yet. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so I, you can, there are lots of people at Cal that have master's degrees. There's lots of people with different professional experiences. Um, um, but, and this isn't really your question, but since you mentioned you were trying to kind of figure out which direction to go, um, I can certainly relate to that. And one of the things that um, was really hard for me is I love teaching. Like, I really, that's, like, that's the thing I'm good at, right? <laughs> that's what I do well. Um, and so the hard thing about not being in an academic career is that there's no teaching tied here. However, being in a place like DC, there are so many places and opportunities to teach. So last year I taught at Georgetown. I'm teaching at the University of Mary Washington right now. And so I actually think that's, it's really, in a way it's nice not to have the teaching and the work connected because, um, I mean, I work with different people. I have different colleagues. I have a broader, you know, experience in, in this area and I get to know a, a broader group of people, which I think is great. Um, it's also extra money when I teach. So that's a nice little thing, um, but uh, I but I think that's been a nice way for me to not be an academic, but still be in the classroom. And I think as an instructor, I bring something that is unique and and uh, special because I, I you know not that academics don't do great work they do, but I mean I do work all the time that are, that's affecting students, affecting teachers, and I can talk to students about how my work as a linguist is important and would be useful in lots of careers. So I feel like, um, you know, as you're thinking about your career path, it doesn't have to really one or the other. You can find ways where they overlap. So that was Great. not your question. <laughs> Great question. Fabulous answers. And I'm sure that you all have, you know, questions of one or, or multiple of the panelists pertaining to your specific situation or something that you thought um, could be a potential touching point. So we're going to network. Yeah. And I'll give it over to Anna. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what happened, guys? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really hard for me to talk about networking in like a minute because I'm writing a book about um, career development, and right now my uh, networking chapter is about 50 pages long. So, here we go. As an interactional sociolinguist, I think we can bring, I'm an interactional sociolinguist, uh, so I think <laughs> you can bring your skills and training to think about lots of different kinds of scenarios. So I bring my skills and training as an interactional sociolinguist to think about an interaction like a networking event. All right, there are understood things that happen at a networking event. Um, Jen, you mentioned, you know, to what extent are we going to be sharing details about our job? Well, that's a good thing to bring to a networking event. Maybe a, a description of something that you're working with, something that you're passionate about. Uh, networking is reciprocal. You bring and you ask for things. It is a moment to be generous. It is also a moment to be vulnerable. It's a moment to ask for something. You need to be able to bring to this encounter a concise, articulated, short way of saying something that you're looking for and maybe something that you can give. So in a moment, you can start thinking now, I'm gonna have you each go around the room very quickly, say a thing that you might be looking for and anything that you might give. Some of the people in this room here have a lot of expertise to offer and I wanna make sure that people who are interested in things know that everyone in this room has something to give and something to receive. 
Um, but I guess I just uh, can't resist to tell a very quick story. Uh, it turns out I uh, love playing this game that I always call the airplane game. Uh, it turns out it's networking. So I sit down on an airplane and I get the other person, because you're trapped there, right? I get the other person starting to talk about themselves. And then I play, how does linguistics impact your life? <laughs> that is networking. Networking is elevating our field in a very specific way. This is how I understand networking. It is helping the world see what they didn't realize they needed, which is a linguist. So, um, and I just want to also to this last point about um, a lot of the points that a lot of you guys raised in your questions about figuring out a way to be a linguist, uh, no matter what it is that you're doing. Uh, I, I, as part of uh, the book that I'm working on right now, I did an interview this week with someone who is a project manager. Probably a lot of you don't know what project management is. Well, uh, turns out she, the a linguist is the perfect person to do project management because project management is very ambiguous. You are rarely handed a job description that can actually say what it is that they need you to do. Your job is to go into a workplace and figure out what is not happening, what is not being said, what is not being done, what is not, uh, you know, what, what are the systems and patterns that are being failed to be being captured and communicated and articulated. Uh, yeah, it turns out the best training in the world for that is a degree in linguistics. So uh, you are being uh, cultivated to do things that you didn't even know existed right now. If you're a student and those of you who have studied linguistics, you have skills and training and abilities that the world needs, uh, and it's about sharing that. So can we go around the room very quickly? A, a quick thing that you have and a quick thing that you might want to get tonight. We start in the back. Hi, I'm Emily Case. Um, I recently got my MS in theoretical linguistics from Georgetown. I work for a software company as a knowledge engineer. We're actually hiring. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carolyn yeah, we'll I'm Carolyn Adger. I'm retired from Cal. And what I can talk about is how you keep on doing linguistics in retirement. Um, <laughs> and get paid for it. <laughs> I want to retire, so I'm going to come talk to you. <laughs> um, I'm John Silite Glassman. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Language and Speech Processing at Johns Hopkins. Um, and as far as what I would like, I'm really interested in how linguistics can help the mission of the U.S. government and generally helping improve access to services and just generally serving the American people. And I can see that working out in a variety of different ways. And what I have to give is that I've done field work in Peru and in Canada, and I've done theoretical linguistics, and so I have data analysis abilities, and I'm getting into computational linguistics right now. And so while my programming isn't that strong yet, I do have a background in natural language processing, machine translation, and generally how computer scientists tend to think about linguistics, which is really different from how linguists tend to think about linguistics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what I want is I want to know how the US government wants linguists to help right now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'm Justin Kelly. I actually am a project manager here at <laughs> We are hiring. All right. well, we're hiring test developers, so you would work with me and Jen. But um, uh, my background is um, in theoretical linguistics. I got my doctorate from Georgetown, and I uh, use linguistics pretty much every day. Hello, everybody. My name is Cecilia Castillo. I work for DC government. I have been a language access and advocacy coordinator there for a while. I work directly with the executives. I work directly with the mayor. Um, what I wanted today, I wanted to hear from these wonderful people because I met many of them where they were students. <laughs> so when I saw their names, I thought I need to see what they are up to. <laughs> many of them, well, but some of them came to me when they were still students and they wanted to know about our institution. So I, I was just curious to know where they were. In terms of well, I'm offering, I don't have much to offer, except I also want to see what is it that people are doing now in linguistics, because 
I've been an advocate for linguists to be higher in government, especially DC government. We work with a lot of linguistic minorities, and people don't get to see the better jobs there. I'm not hiring directly right now, but there is a position, <laughs> and I know I sent an announcement about it in the Office of Nation Pacific Island Affairs. So if you speak for any of those languages, they need you desperately, and they pay very well. So that's, that's Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> Next. I'm Julia Ariel. I'm a fourth year student at Georgetown and a first year in the Master's in Language and Communication. Um, in my very limited work experience, I've volunteered as an ESL teacher at a refugee center, and I've also taught at a Spanish immersion program for native speakers of English. Um, an area that's kind of piqued my interest recently is uh, multicultural education and education policy, so I'd be very interested to know career paths that I can take with that, and maybe ways I can use that experience. We're doing great. We're sharing lots of ideas, but we also need to leave time for networking. So one quick thing that you have, one quick thing that you want. My name is Nicole Holiday. I'm a fifth year PhD student at NYU. Um, I am sort of just interested in seeing what the jobs were that people were doing. And actually, I'm an intern at the Census. I work on my Glenn's team. So if you want to know what it's like to be an intern at the Census, I can tell you that. Hey. All good things. All good things. Oh, very good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kate, and I'm a second year student at the um, MLC of Georgetown. And what I have to offer is I have done the you don't know you need me, but you do for to get my current job, um, again, at a trade association with engineers. So that's something you're interested in, and how do you make that happen? I can talk about that. And what I'm looking for is, again, partially to be my own desire to stay involved in this community of academia and to think about ways that I can strengthen those skills even while I am working. So I'm Allison Reed with the Linguistic Society of America. Um, what I have to give, um, <laughs> I have uh, a lot of uh, expertise in the intersection between public policy and uh, all of the different scholarly disciplines. Um, uh, and I have no training in linguistics, so one of the things I need to take is uh, your expertise about linguistics and how the LSA can do a better job of applying your expertise to policy issues, and I'm very interested in talking to you about um, your interest in government, um, uh, because there's some things you might not be aware of that I am, and I think we could have a meeting with a month. Cool. Jump over here. Okay. I'm Aysulu, I'm a third year student in sociolinguistics in Georgetown, and I did my master in secondary interpretation. So this is what I can offer, sociolinguistic perspective and secondary language acquisition, and I'm looking for the, the ways to realize it in more real projects. I'm Sam, I work um, with Jen and Justin here at Cal um, on the same project in language testing. I'm also an MLC, a Master's in Language Communication alum. And um, what I can give is, I guess, I'm a technical specialist here, so I work on a very specific part of the test. So if you want to learn more about the micro applications of sociolinguistics to that, then feel free to come talk to me. But, um, but I just came to hear everyone's experience. Hi, my name is Olivia. I'm a fourth year grad student at the University of Maryland in the second language education program. Um, what I want to get is I just want to hear different um, job careers and experiences that people have. I'm very interested in finding a career outside of academia but still in the research world, so just kind of seeing what different paths are out there. But I can give, I'm also a graduate research assistant at the Center for Advanced Study Language, so basically a government contractor that also works very closely with the university, so I'd love to talk about that experience. Um, hi, I'm Carly Ferri. I um, got my master's at UGA a year ago in linguistics um, in SLA and syntax, which are extremely different things. Um, <laughs> the whole past year, I was teaching English at the University of Macau near Hong Kong. Um, so I've just moved to DC, and I don't know anyone. So I actually came here to network. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and to just see what opportunities are here. Um, I don't really know what that scene looks like in DC. Um, what I have to offer, I have two years of experience teaching English in China, um, experience uh, with Chinese, um, and just knowledge of, of 
the way that language educators <coughs> think differently about language than linguists. Nicole? Uh, Cole, as I said, I'm an undergrad, so I don't have too much time for yet. Uh, but I'm definitely interested in the intersections between education and legal sites, primarily on the international level. I did education, I was advising for um, students in primarily Eastern Europe how to get their degree in UK, USO, um, educational advising, and possibly, hopefully, curriculum development to an extent. Great. I think I kind of um, applied to cover of education. I was a high school teacher, and I was a Cal staff. Um, this close to a PhD in sociolinguistics. <laughs> um, I can give a teacher's perspective on things, which I know firsthand and also as an ethnographer. What I'd like to take, because I can do that, you don't know you need me if you need me. I can do that, but I don't know how to make it into a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd like any assistance I can get in getting over that. <laughs> I'm Allison, once again. It's, Again, for speaking to us. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in Spanish Applied Linguistics at Georgetown. I'm also the assistant director of the Spanish program for Intermediate Spanish. Uh, so I can talk to you a little bit about curriculum development if you're interested. And uh, what I wanted to get here was to hear an outside perspective from academia and what everyone's up to. So thank you again. Um, I'm Rachel. I got my PhD in linguistics last year from UT Austin. And um, I guess I can talk about how to transition from linguistics into tech. Um, I'm working in data science now, and we're hiring. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess what I want is this to meet ling linguists, because since moving from Austin, I don't do so much linguistics anymore. <laughs> yeah. Last row? Sure. My name is Ann Butler. I'm a first year student in the Master's in Language and Communication at Georgetown. Uh, what I have to give is I have work experience in. Um, program management in a multinational nonprofit. Uh, I also have a background in um, a little bit in business and in marketing. Uh, so what I would love to get is to find an organization or a group of organizations that does multinational, uh, transnational communications, particularly with an eye to interning. Um, I would love to find an internship line here in Georgetown for the next two years. Hi, I'm Randy Darrow. I am a second year master's student at Georgetown in Applied Linguistics. What I have to give, um, I do have a bit of experience in teaching and also the skills that I'm currently learning at Georgetown in Applied. Um, I came here just because I'm going to graduate in May and I wanted to know what's out there for Applied Linguistics. So. Hi, my name is Yoma. Um, I'm a third year PhD student at the Applied Linguistic Concentration at Georgetown. Um, but I have to be, I don't have much to give. I think I'm very interested in English testing, especially um, heritage speakers and very interested in them. So that's what I have to give. And what I came for actually, like the title says, I wanted to know more about what's linguistics outside of academia because most of the times people just um, Label you, you know, like you study linguistics, so you have you you must go to academia or something like that. So I wanted to know um, what's outside. I am Rachel. I'm a fourth semester, kind of in between the uh, PhD student at Georgetown. Um, what I have to give, I taught ESL in Mexico for eight years, and I have a lot of experience with Spanish, English translation, and bilingual lexicography. And I basically wanted to sing as young as just to hear what can we do if we don't want to go into academia. Thank you. Well, hopefully you have lots of stories, lots of ideas, lots of questions. Thank you for coming Thank and you. now network. <laughs> one, thing, one thing before we get started is again, we will follow up with you because this is, you just witnessed um, one of the many diverse events that the special interest group puts on. So we'll be in touch um, about that. <laughs> There are refreshments out in the hall, and we will just be mingling for the next little while. And thank our panel. Thank you.